What about EM waves and conductors? How do they behave? Um, hi, this is Jonathan Gardner. We're at section 8.31 of Griffith's Introduction to Electrodynamics, second edition. We're now looking at how waves behave inside of a conductor. We've already thoroughly, exhaustively ex uh, looked at how waves behave in linear media um, with uh, you know a surface boundary, uh, a flat surface boundary. Now we're going to have um, our EM waves traveling in a conductor, and the difference between a conductor and, and a an insulator is that the conductor has a current, the free current, which is equal to the um, conductivity times the electric field. Okay, and this kind of throws a, a, a monkey wrench into our uh, Maxwell's equations. They now read uh, one. We have the divergence of E is equal to whatever free charge we have. We'll talk about that in a second. 2, the divergence of the B vector, is equal to 0 until somebody finds a monopole. And 3, we have the curl of the E field is equal to the time derivative of the B field, negative the time derivative of the B field. And 4, uh, we have this new term that we have to worry about. The 4, um, so now we have uh, mu times the current but we have the current is just sigma e uh, plus mu epsilon dE by dt. Okay, so the monkey wrench, there's actually two monkey wrenches we have to worry about. We could have a free charge and we could have that current there. Um, we have a continuity equation that relates current and charge. Basically the divergence of the free current has to equal a negative of the time derivative of the free charge. And that basically, that should be rather obvious why that is. If you have current flowing from a point, then the charge at that point is decreasing over time. If you have a current flowing towards a point, then you have a charge increasing at that point. Um, when we combine this Ohm's law and Gauss's law together, we find that the time derivative of the, the charge is equal to sigma uh, times the basically um, JF is sigma E which this is that so we have sigma over epsilon rho F okay so the negative time derivative of the charge density is equal to sigma over epsilon of the charge density, which is a very interesting result. So that's a differential equation there. Solving for that differential equation, we find that the free charge, as it varies over time, must equal E to the minus sigma over ET epsilon T times the initial charge. Okay. What is this value for sigma over well, so for this one, it's basically you know an exponential curve where the tau, the time it takes to reduce by a third, is just epsilon over sigma, right? Um, if if you put charge anywhere on a conductor, it's going to make its way to the edges um, rather quickly, um, mostly because the epsilon divided by this, this connectivity gives you a very small number. So for our purposes, we can assume that if there were a free charge anywhere, it would almost instantly dissipate, at least in relation to any of the waves we're going to talk about, right? And so we're going to assume that there is no free charge. We're going to set this to zero for our wave equation, which dramatically simplifies things. Now things are no longer practically impossible to work out. Let's work out what happens when we take the curl of uh, the curl. So the curl of the curl is equal to the curl of the B field uh, the curl of a curl let me flip to the book here is the gradient of the divergence 
minus the Laplacian of the field. And so we have a minus sign here, minus d by dt of the curl of the B field. You can move that inside. Uh, the divergence of E is zero. That's zero. So now we have the Laplacian of the E field is equal to the time derivative of the curl of the B field. Well, what's the curl of the B field? That's just mu sigma E. There's that current plus mu epsilon d uh, e by dt. So it's mu sigma d by dt of e plus mu epsilon d squared by dt squared of the e field. Okay. This almost looks like a wave equation. Um, if we could ignore this term in the middle, it would be a very obvious wave equation, but we can't. Um, the solution for this wave equation is rather simple. Um, oh, uh, if we did the same thing for the B field, we would get the uh, Laplace into the B field would be mu epsilon. Oh, I'm sorry, put things backwards, mu sigma. Um, basically, I wrote the terms backwards. So the d squared terms are here, and then the single terms are there. So um, we, we could um, write the wave equation and then introduce that decay term, or we could just write it out this way. We could say that e vector is equal to some epsilon naught curly vector e to the i. This is the trick. Kappa complex x minus omega t. Okay, And this complex, the real part is going to multiply by i and give you the, the rotating term that goes on forever. The imaginary part is going to multiply by the i and give you an actual negative number. Okay, So that'll give you the decay term. Okay, so we can write it out this way. E to the kappa imaginary term minus that. E to the I kappa the real term x and then E to the minus I omega t. Okay, where um, kappa complex is equal to kappa plus i kappa minus. Okay, so kappa plus and kappa minus are both real numbers, but uh, kappa is that. Um, the kappa that we have to use in order to make this equation work, so kappa squared must equal, well, doesn't really matter, does it? Uh, mu epsilon omega squared plus i mu sigma omega, okay? And when you plug this in to these equations up here, you're gonna recover um, the solution. It should be rather obvious. So uh, how do you calculate kappa plus and kappa minus? Well, kappa plus or minus is equal to omega times the square root of epsilon mu over two times the square root of something big of one plus sigma over epsilon and omega squared, and then plus or minus, depending on which one you're doing, one, and all of that is to the square, that's the square root of that, okay. So it's the square root of a square root plus or minus one. Um, I hope this isn't too confusing. This, 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 okay. Um, if it is, um, it may help if you thought of things this way. So you have this term that gives you a wave, this term that this gives you a wave in the x direction, this gives you a wave in the time direction, and this gives you attenuation in the x direction, okay. Um, the skin depth 
is the depth by which the amplitude of the wave will decrease by about one over, one over e, which is about one third. Skin depth is just simply one divided by kappa minus. Okay, that's called the skin depth. It gives you a good feel of how how deep that wave is going to penetrate into stuff. Um, we can calculate the propagation speed, the index of refraction, normal way. So our lambda wavelength is a 2 pi over the real part of the kappa. Our velocity is omega divided by kappa, the real part. And n is just the speed of light times kappa, the real part of kappa times omega. Okay. Um, for a poor conductor, where sigma is much less than epsilon omega. Okay. So it's a uh, small value. Um, in this case, our kappa is roughly equal to, if we stick it in here and take a look, right? So this term is um, very small. We can simplify that to just omega times the square root of uh, epsilon mu. Okay? For, oh, the kappa minus simplifies to, this is the imaginary part, so it's a real number, square root. Okay. For a good conductor, sigma is much greater than epsilon omega. And for that, we have kappa plus is almost equal to kappa minus, which is almost equal to omega sigma mu over 2. Okay. Um, the skin depth, of course, is dependent on the inverse of kappa minus. So here, the skin depth does not depend on frequency. And here, the skin depth is Right? As the frequency gets bigger, the skin depth gets smaller. Okay, So as we go on higher and higher frequency, shorter and shorter lambdas get smaller. In fact, the skin depth is about equal to lambda. It's about equal to the wavelength of the wave that we're talking about. Um, since um, it's about one-sixth of the wavelength, the attenuation is so quick that, you know, for all intents and purposes, it doesn't even penetrate. It just kind of just wiggles a little bit at the surface there and does nothing. Okay, next we're going to talk about seawater and submarines. After we talk about seawater and submarines, uh, we'll move on to section 8.32 and look at how the plane waves, monochronic plane waves, behave in the conducting medium. Thanks for your time. I hope you got something out of this. Uh, be sure to like and comment and share with your friends. And if you have any questions, I would love to ask them. Take care. Bye.